And good morning again to the saints here in along Highway 395 and Deer Park. And I don't know where you all come from. Some of you from various villages and and maybe out in the countryside and the mountainsides and the farms and the fields. And and I know that we have a blessing to worship God in this special place. If I lived near here, this is where I'd come on Sabbath morning too. And I'm thankful to be here with you. In Isaiah 58 is a prescription for the problems that we're facing as God's people living in the end of time. He starts by saying, cry aloud and spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. How many enjoy doing that? This is not a popular work, is it? Were prophets in the Bible always popular? They they were feared. I, I remember uh, talking with a, a teacher at Loma Linda when I was a student there. He was an old professor that was way back in the you know, 30s, 1930s, when Bur uh, John Burden was still alive. John Burden was a pastor who was the founder of Loma Linda as a college of medical evangelists. And, and he personally knew Ellen White and had many letters that he'd received from her. And he said to, to my friend that I knew growing up, he said, uh, when Ellen White wrote him a letter and the post, it was posted, St. Helena, and, and he knew it was from Ellen White, he said, weren't you excited to open her letter? He said, absolutely not. We were scared to death at what it had, might contain because it would be another counsel, uh, another thing that what we were doing wrong. And uh, he, he was not, I mean, he respected her highly and loved her deeply, but he was afraid to open her letters because she might be showing something that they had to address and straighten out. And so Isaiah, he says, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Now, I don't know how many of you have a trumpet voice, but there are some people who have an extremely loud, commanding voice, and others in an emergency would generate that kind of voice. One time in Oregon, the, the uh, side of the hill fell off on Highway 101, right by the ocean there that goes down the coast and there was a big slice taken out of the road and the first man that came upon that scene he, he saw the landslide from a rainstorm and all and he stopped his car and he turned his car crossways in the road and he went ran up the road waving his arms and shouting at the top of his lungs stop 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 the roads washed out and long before the Department of Transportation knew about it and the highway patrol had come. He had probably saved many lives from just barreling down that road and going off into, into the water. So there's a time to cry aloud and spare not. And, and so it says, show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Now this is, this is the house of who? Of Jacob. Is that, is that the world out there? Is that the heathen? The, uh, the liberals? This is God's people show them what they're doing wrong. And, uh, and yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. We could all say that as a nation that did righteousness. And then it says, but you're not seeing what we're doing. We're fasting and you're not hearing our prayers. And I've learned something recently about prayer. And I want to share it with you. Because our prayers are too uh, routine. We say the same thing over and over. Not just 
Now I lay me down to sleep, but we bless the food the same way. We pray for the same people the same way. And I would like to suggest to you, and I'm trying to do the same myself, that you pray over a promise when you pray. Because God is, he enjoys being reminded of his promises. And there's several thousand of them in the Bible. But you can pray a specific prayer over a specific promise that's not generic. Uh, generic promises would be like, whatsoever ye ask, or ask and it shall be given you. But specific promises, Lord, that I may have my eyesight. Lord, that I may hear your voice. Uh, specific prayers for specific needs. I printed a book some years ago. They've gone out of print now. I probably need to reprint it. It's called Precious Promises Prescriptions. And the promises of the Bible are all categorized by illness. Uh, gastrointestinal, cardiovascular, neurologic, uh, fear, anxiety, depression. And, and I put the promises categorized in this a little flip pocket book. I need to get, get some more and give some to you as well as everybody else. But, but you can find in the Bible specific promises and when you kneel down to pray, Lord, I, today I want to talk to somebody about you. Today I'd like to encourage somebody that is at, discouraged. Or I have a neighbor who's on hospice or who's sick and help me to connect with that person. Will he do that for you? For the children that are here, I want to tell you how I prayed one Sabbath for a blessing and how God answered that prayer. Um, Sabbath is supposed to be a special day. It is a special day, but sometimes we think of it as a day we can't do this and can't do that and have to leave that aside. And, and, and I, I decided to pray for a special blessing for that Sabbath. And one thing that I like is studying nature. Now driving here and up uh, on the country roads yesterday when I kind of got lost getting back to Spokane and, and went through uh, a town with a very strange name, forgive me if you live there, called Tum Tum. <laughs> I, I, I thought whoever came up with that, that name, but then there's Walla Walla and, and, yeah. and then I realized that there's other repetitions God's prophet says, get ready, get ready, get ready. So if, if you want to say it three times you, or twice, you can. But I was praying for a blessing and, and, and like driving down these country roads where I was looking at the uh, metal larks and the uh, western bluebird and the magpie and I saw birds that I don't see where I live in Oregon, up here in the eastern part of Washington that I got to know when I was a boy came to visit relatives here. So, so here's how the Lord answered my prayer. And behind our house was a bird feeder and, and it had uh, little thistle seeds in it for, for goldfinches and pine siskins. And on Sabbath afternoon, I saw a, a group of pine siskins that had come. They, they come in flocks. So they were all enjoying the bird feeder. <clears throat> so I walked out the door, trying to be careful not to scare them away. And I walked closer and closer and closer. And the little bird was getting a seed and biting it and putting it in its crop sack where it stays for a while. And, and so I got close enough that I put my hand out toward the bird. And like I used to do as a boy with a parakeet in a cage, I, I put it right next to its chest. This is a pine siskin, a wild bird. And I put my finger right here and it jumped up on, on my finger and then continued eating, continue, continued getting seeds as I held it on my finger. And it was so, such a precious Sabbath blessing as like a foretaste of heaven when the birds won't be afraid of us and the 
even the deer won't run away. Uh, and, and the other animals, the rabbits and the wild animals that are around where I live. But I was able to hold the bird for quite a time. And then I moved it apart and it was, couldn't eat the seeds. So it just turned it around to look at me. And then I put it back down on the little stick where the bird feeder was and let it continue eating. And I thought, Lord, you want the Sabbath to be a blessing? Give us a blessing. So I'd like to encourage you children to ask God for a special blessing when the Sabbath is coming on. Another Sabbath, I, I prayed for a blessing and, and I looked out the window and there next to the garden fence was what I thought was a couple of horses. But I looked closer and some of them had horns. I said, those aren't horses. And, uh, and it was elk. And they'd come out of the woods down to the, the grassy field. And, and then I started counting and counting and counting. And there were about 32, a whole herd of elk that came out of the forest and were browsing there on a Friday evening, just as the Sabbath was coming. And, and I just stood and watched them in awe. Didn't go over close to see if I could pet them, you understand. There's a time and place for caution, especially these big bull elk that were like this, guarding their, their harem. And so I just watched, but then something uh, spooked them and, and I heard some of the bigger elk guardians make a snort and they all stampeded off into the woods again. And so God has ways of giving us contact with nature. And, and I want to say that for the encouragement of the young people here, that you should pray for special things and have God give you special answers to your prayers. And then we should all be praying for an ability to reach people for, for Christ and to advance his cause. Now, I want to share with you some things I've learned recently and some parallels to our Christian walk. Because the Seventh-day Adventist group that was formed out of the disappointment of 1844 is called a movement, not a church. A church is more of a formal thing. It's a, it means people, not a building as you know, but we were a movement, the Advent movement. We were to help prepare the way for Jesus coming and to take the gospel to the world. You know, there's only two religious organizations that are worldwide today. Uh, one is the Catholic Church, that's everywhere. The other is the Seventh-day Adventist Church that is in countries all over the world. And yet in spite of that, about 40% of the world's population need to know who Jesus is. They've, ever, they've not even heard the gospel story or become acquainted with Christ. Uh, those that lead out in our mission movement, such as Adventist Frontier Missions, call it the 1040 window, the, between the 10 and the 40 latitudes in, in the world map. And it's across Asia, across uh, to China and northern and, and uh, Sahara area of Africa. And there's millions and millions of people that don't know Christ. And how are they going to get to know? There's one way they're finding out in Muslim countries where Christians are restricted. Uh, they're having dreams and visions. And... And one of the websites that you can look up is called Dreams of Isis, I-S-U, I think, or I-S-U-S. And that's the Arabic name for, Christ, for Jesus. And they're, they're being visited personally in the night with dreams where Jesus is inviting them to come follow him. And then they go looking for people. And there are uh, radio stations that are reaching them in in Israel today. It's located in the city of Nazareth and it's reaching the 
Islamic people in the West Bank and in Jordan and, and other nearby countries, that if they convert to Christianity and they accept Christ, some of their relatives consider it their religious duty to end their life. And so it's a very dangerous thing and it's a courageous stand that they take to accept Christ. But we are a movement and, and Adventism has four basic doctrines. Now, in your bulletin, as, as I do in our bulletin, there's a longer list and some scripture texts and I would encourage you to take that and memorize the, those points so that you can defend your faith with a few scripture texts on any question anybody would ask about your beliefs. Okay. All of us should be able to give at least three or maybe six Bible texts on the Sabbath, the uh, second coming, the spirit of prophecy, the state of the dead, or the sanctuary. Those are the big five, the five S's. And, and if you can do that, you, you'll pass the test as a, as a missionary in your neighborhood. But I would encourage you to at least get six texts down for each one of those subjects. And, and there are many Christians that they know more about the batting averages of the sports heroes and the, who, who the statistics are about the football quarterbacks or or the soccer heroes, or the movie stars, than they are about the Bible texts that need to be in the mind for a time when you don't have your cell phone. <laughs> that, that, I suppose most of you have the Bible downloaded on your cell phone. If you don't, go to eSword and, and ask for them to, it's an app, that loads the entire Bible, plus other books and concordances and, and uh, commentaries on the Bible, and you can have that with you in your pocket all the time. You can also download the entire Spirit of Prophecy and have that carried around, and, and much better to meditate on that when you're waiting for an appointment or in a bus station or the airport or at the gas station when there's a long line, than to just surf the, the internet. So, I want to tell you about one person I've learned of recently, and, and there are many Christians today that are in prison for their faith. None of you are, or you wouldn't be here today, or you'd have an ankle bracelet on, or some other symbol of your incarceration. But uh, there is a man by the name of Andrew Brunson. Have, how many have heard of him? A, a missionary in the country of Turkey. He and his wife and family went there and, and spent more than 20 years as a missionary establishing churches. And, and then the government, under the current man, Ergadan, uh, decided that he was a dangerous person and they considered him public enemy number one. And he, he had even a, a visa to stay there in the country or he had applied for that. He was going to spend the rest of his life. His children went back to America to study. But he got a summons to the police office and he thought it was so that they could give him his permanent residence. Instead, they arrested him and his wife, and put them in prison, accusing them of plotting against the government, accusing them of uh, uh, terror, terrorist activity, all false. His wife was let out after two weeks, and the friends said, please come back to America. Your children need you. Let the Lord take care of your husband. You know what she said? She said, he needs me more now than ever before. I'm going to stay and see him as often as they'll let me, even every day if possible. Well, they only let her in about once a week and for you know, five minutes. But he, she was an anchor to her husband when he was incarcerated there. 
He, he was in prison in some of the maximum security prisons in Turkey, accused of plotting against the, of the overthrow of the governance. And he was in prison for three years. It became an international uh, incident when Christian people started clamoring for his release. He has written a book and it's called God's Hostage. I came upon that book not long ago, have read it, been deeply impressed by this man because he, he was put, he was the only Christian in the prison and with six people to a cell that normally had about three beds. So they're even having to sleep in shifts in their overcrowded prison. And most of them were political prisoners, but he was, a, a, you could say political, but it was a religious imprisonment. And so the Christian people in America began clamoring for his release at the, in the Congress, at the United Nations, and to the government of Turkey. It was uh, denied completely. And when he went to trial, he was given a life sentence in prison after serving for 20 years in Turkey as a missionary. Fortunately, at the time, we had a president in the White House and a vice president that had more Christian leanings than some of them have in recent years. And so Mr. Pence actually went over there and, and, con and several senators went over, Christian senators, clamoring for his release. And, and President Trump uh, wrote to the government and demanded his release, all to be denied. But our government has ways of putting pressure on other countries when they don't go along with the system. He said, we will cripple your economy if you do not turn uh, Pastor Brunson loose. Which started to happen. I mean, if you block, imp talk about no buy, no sell. It's already in place. It can be instituted against anybody at any time, including you and me. But uh, this brought Turkey to its senses. And, uh, and so one night, a guard came in to the cell where Pastor Wormbrin was, I, I'm not Wormbrin, Brunson, Brunson was uh, staying and said, get your things and he thought they were going to transfer him to another prison. Instead, they put him in a car, took him to the airport, and an, a U.S. Air Force plane was waiting for him on the runway. Picked him up with his wife, who was still there, took them to Germany. In the middle of the night, the ambassador to Germany met him and, and gave took him to a place where he could get a shower and some food, and then flew him to Washington, D.C., landed at Andrews Air Force Base, and the next day he was sitting in the White House with the president and some of his cabinet. And, and when he came in and shook the hands of Mr. Trump, he said, Mr. President, before we talk, there's one thing I've wanted to do for several years. I want to pray for you. And he knelt down, took his hand, and prayed for the President of the United States. As well as thanking him and the other, the Vice President and the other ones that had been instrumental in getting his release. And, and he did not know that was happening until they just said, get your things. But God turned him loose. He said, when I came back to America, I didn't realize how close we were coming to being a totalitarian country ourselves. And what a crisis was facing Christians in, in the USA. And so he has produced a series of talks 
on how to get ready for a crisis based on what he went through when he was incarcerated. One had to do with depression, giving up. There was a time when he really wanted to die because he didn't want to live the rest of his life in that squalid conditions in a, in a prison. And, and then he accepted that God was in charge of his life and that he's going to do what he sees best. And it's when he surrendered himself, his family, and his whole future to God that God released him and brought him back. And he has traveled from place to place. There are, all, there are ministers in, in Canada who have been imprisoned for their faith. It's going to come to us as well. One of the reasons why in China there is such a strong house uh, church movement led by women is because the men have been taken to prison and the wives are carrying on the work and they're going to be just as faithful as their husbands were but for some reason China has let the women stay in and and they hold hold the fort you might say in Sweden years ago during the Reformation it was forbidden to speak about the gospel and who did he use he used little children. I have been in a, in a city in Sweden, the country of Sweden, where, where that happened. And where little children, I mean like five and six year olds, uh, would stand up on a table and take a Bible in their hand and give an eloquent sermon. And, and God's Spirit moved them to speak just as a, a great evangelist might do. And then after they were finished, they went back to playing with their dolls and their toys or whatever they had as, as children and talking uh, with their peers. But God is going to use this. You know, in the book of Daniel, where it talks about heroes, like Daniel chapter 3. Of course, it starts with chapter 1 where they were convicted about their diet and about the things they were going to put in their mouth. But in Daniel 3, they built this great image. You know, Nebuchadnezzar wasn't satisfied to be the head of gold. He wanted to have Babylon be all gold and, la and live forever. When they, when they came to see the king, that's what they said. O king, live forever. We sing now, God save the queen or God save the king. But it was, O oh, king, live forever. And, and so they built this image. And it was a big one. An image of gold, three score cubits, 15 times higher than, than a, a human being. And the breadth, six cubits, about nine feet by maybe 90 feet, and set it up on the plain. And then they were to bow down and worship it. It says in verse 5, when you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Is God using music today to influence people? All the political rallies of this election year have music to pump people up and get them all excited. And they're not the patriotic songs that we sing like God Bless America, Land That We Love, or My Country Tis of Thee. They're rock music with drums and beats. And, and, uh, and to pump people up, they're using music today. The devil's using music. And he did back then all kinds of music, it says, to get them to fall down and worship. But the inducement of music is not enough for some people. Music, even in a supermarket, can get people buying stuff. Or in a, in a department store, they use music that gets you ready to... Uh, impulsively purchase items. 
But some people aren't influenced like that. So Nebuchadnezzar had another method. Verse 6 says, Whosoever, Whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Probably the same furnace that they'd use to melt the gold to make the image in the first place. Set up right next to it. Uh, a fiery furnace. And you know gold melts at a lower temperature than steel and certainly they could make it out of brick or stone and it would last. So what did most of the people do? They all bowed down. Do you think some of them were Jews? There were lots of Jews because they'd taken uh, two invasions of Jerusalem. They'd taken captive many, many Jews, not just Daniel and his friends. And so we don't know in the Bible the names of but three that were there. Daniel, I think, was hidden somewhere by the king or sent him on an errand and he knew he would stand and so he didn't subject him to the test. Uh, similar to St. Bartholomew's Day Massager in France when Ambrose Perre, the French barber surgeon that was a Huguenot, a, a Protestant, was hidden by the king from being uh, in that massacre. He, he hid him in his bedroom because he was a barber surgeon and he was valuable to the king at, at cutting off his lumps and warts and things and, and uh, helping his soldiers that had been hurt in battle to get patched up and, and healed. And so even though he knew he was a Protestant, he hid him in his bedroom. I think, I don't know where Daniel was hiding, but I think he was somewhere uh, in a safe place. But Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego were there among thousands of other people, and they stood tall. So we don't know about the, the thousands of people that gave in. All we know is the few that stood up. And in the last of time, it won't matter who gives in. It matters whether you stand tall or not. Amen. You, God wants you to be ready to stand up and be counted. Uh, that's a phrase, by the way, that comes from town halls in New Hampshire. And when there was a meeting of the people uh, and they call, this is rules of order of a business meeting, they say, I would call for a division of the house. And that means that they want to take a roll call. And so they have everybody stand up and the ones for a certain item go and line up on this wall and another line up on that wall and they go one, two, three, four, five, and and. That's what it means to be, stand up and be counted. It doesn't mean that you all sit there and everybody says no. And nobody knows who spoke and who didn't. You just get the volume of the sound to decide the vote. So that's, that's the principle of it. So these young men, they stood up and Nebuchadnezzar even gave them a second chance. And we studied that important uh, warning you what the consequences would be. Uh, but they said, we don't need a second chance. Verse 17 says, we are, or 16, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now, did that make Nebuchadnezzar happy? To know that there's three strong-minded, faithful young Hebrews that served in his cabinet or in his government. It says he was full of fury and the form of his visage was changed. That means he, he looked angry more than he'd ever looked before. And he commanded that they heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. I don't think this means 17 times. Seven times more heat is plenty for a furnace that's already able to melt gold. So 
So let's say gold melts at about uh, 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, if it's seven times hotter, 5,600 degrees, will that melt steel? Oh yes, that's way above welding temperatures. That would vaporize a person just like that. And when the soldiers got close, they died instantly. See, heat stroke or something that just took their lives just like that. But they threw these three men into the furnace. I don't know if they landed on their feet or just landed in a heap because they were tied up hand and, hand and foot. And as they're in there, instantly the ropes all burnt off. But did they burn up? Not a singe of their hair. You know, if you get close to something like a campfire, your hair will burn or your beard will burn faster than, than your skin or your clothes even. And so there was not even the smell of smoke on these young men. But better than that, who else went in the fire with them? Jesus was in there. And Nebuchadnezzar recognized him. He said, I see the four people in there, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. How did he know who, what the Son of God looked like? It must be re reflecting his image in, in those three young men, or in Daniel, because they, they knew God. Now, that's happened a long time ago, more than 2,500 years ago. But is it going to happen again? It happened in the early Christian church. John, they tried to make a martyr out of him. Christian history tells that he, they put him in a pot of boiling oil and he came out unscathed. That's why they exiled him to the island of Patmos because they couldn't destroy him. And I know down through the ages, there were many martyrs. There's going to be martyrs in the end of time. Some people will be like John the Baptist, that God says the best way to preserve him is to end his life quickly because he'll stand for me, but he might cave in if he's subjected to prolonged incarceration or, or torture. But if you want to read some inspiring Stories about this, read the book about Andrew Brunson, God's Hostage, or Noble Alexander, a Seventh-day Adventist pastor that was in Cuba under Castro and was incarcerated there for 20 years. I met the man. I was, I was invited to teach at a, a meeting of the uh, Northwestern Conference, which is... Uh, a group of pastors, mostly Hispanic and, and black pastors from uh, the Northeast. And I was sitting at a table and I saw this man. I said, I, I, do you know this brother? I said, I've never met him. I don't know him. This is Noble Alexander. Oh, it's good to meet you, brother. I could see scars and you know signs of uh, torture on the man, but he had a pleasant smile and and I, I'd never heard of him before. So before I left that conclave, I bought his book and read the story of his imprisonment in, in Cuba, one of the worst prisons in the world at that time. And while he was in there, he gave Bible studies. He baptized people. He raised up many Christian believers and was faithful to God and then got released through political pressure again uh, from, our, from our government and, and some Christian leaders. There's also a book by, about John Wiedner called Flee the Captor, going back to World War II. And of course, Richard Wormbrand's book, Tortured for Christ. And I'm not just talking about suffering for God, but unless we are willing to suffer for him, we're not ready to give the loud cry or to go through the time of trouble such as never was. Where our life is not as precious as what we stand for and the truth for Jesus. 
And so I, I appeal to you to, be, to get ready for these crises. Now, Satan also knows that this is coming. Turn to the book of Revelation again, and you will see what he knows. Revelation 12, verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath because he knows something. What does he know? He knows he has a short time. And he's so angry, verse 17 says, he's wroth with the woman. Who is the woman in this part of the Bible? That's God's people. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Who are the remnant? The last ones. The last ones. The remnant. Who, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, in the state of uh, Louisiana, they just passed, a, a, not a, a law, but a declaration from the governor that they had to post the Ten Commandments in every school. Did you know that's become very controversial? For our first time, they're saying, oh, we believe in separation of church and state. And yet every other state has a problem of sin that is unparalleled, of commandment breaking, because many of the children growing up and going to school don't even know what the Ten Commandments are. They have not been taught either in their homes or in their schools about the Ten Commandments. So I'm not worried about the separation of church and state. I do believe in those principles, but I think we need to give children a basis for morality. And the moral standards are found in the Ten Commandments uh, as a safeguard, as a protection again, for our society. So, so Satan is going to go after those that keep the commandments of God. That tells us that it's not enough to know the commandments. So let's say they post it on the wall in a school and the children see it once in a while or they even recite it or write a term paper about it. That doesn't say anything about keeping the Ten Commandments. And, and when God comes, brings every person up in the judgment, which is more important, to know the Ten Commandments or to keep them? And then it says, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, you know this text. It's found in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, that defines what that means. Revelation 19, verse 10. And, and this is a principle that came out of a terrible mistake. Because... John was conversing with an angel that was so impressive that he fell at his feet to worship the angel. Are we supposed to worship angels? So if any angel accepts worship, what do we know? It's not, a, not God's angel. It's the devil's angels. And so, and that's true of any man. If any man, whether he wear a cap on his head or a white robe or a red robe or a black robe and 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 accepts worship we know he's of the devil not of God so the angel said don't do it I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy so the remnant have the testimony of Jesus 
and that is the spirit of prophecy. And we, as Seventh-day Adventists, apply that to the writings of Ellen White. But it's more than that. It's all the prophets of God. And it's those that are inspired by the Holy Spirit to give a prophetic voice that's true. And the only way to know for sure is to test it according to the Bible. So if God gives somebody else the gift of prophecy for a specific instance or a need, uh, it has to match with the Bible. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, there's what? No light in them. If there's no light, what is it called? Darkness. Darkness is not a, a, a something in and of itself. It's the absence of light. So there is what God is looking for. Now, Satan can counterfeit this. Just as Jesus warned against false prophets, there are even uh, counterfeits to the Godhead. And an example was Satan before he was even cast out of heaven. He said, I will be like the Most High. Satan wants to counterfeit the Father, God the Father, and which is treason against the government of heaven, and which is why he got thrown out and will be destroyed. Then there's a counterfeit to Jesus. Is there a person on this earth who actually claims to be the vicar of the Son of God and, and stands in the place of Christ and accepts worship and claims to be able to absolve sins? Is there a being like that? What's he called? He's called the Pope of Rome. And so uh, I'm not saying anything against the person that occupies that position, except he's being used of the devil, and, and we should not follow that kind of leadership. And so whether he says we should worship on Sunday, is there a counterfeit to God's day of worship? Well, yes, there is. And so now is there a counterfeit to the Holy Spirit? The modern movement of spiritualism that has actually come into the charismatic movement and puts the impressions of the Spirit above the plain word of God is a, is a counterfeit. It, it turns into a threefold counterfeit. And you see it in Revelation 12 and 13. One is the dragon, one is the first beast that came up out of the sea, and one is the second beast that came out of the earth. And you'll see that also in Revelation chapter 16. And they're gathering people today just as predicted. This is Revelation 16, 13. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the pro false prophet. I call this the fraud head. We have the Godhead, and we have the fraud head, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. We have Satan, the Roman Catholicism, and the apostate Protestants. For they are the spirit of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. That battle is going to be over a day, over a day of worship. And, and the great day of God is, is the Sabbath, which will be the final controversy. Now, I want to give you a little word study. And it's going to be brief and abbreviated. <coughs> but I, <coughs> I like to look up words. I've already talked about looking up promises. But God's people in the end of time, according to Revelation chapter 7, the 
the first three verses, says, After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now I remember years ago when I was in college, our, our choir went down to Disneyland in California and we sang Christmas carols there. Hey. All kinds of schools did that. It used to be a tradition back in the days when Christmas carols were uh, more popular. Now it's Santa Claus and other secular things. But, but when I went into the place, they stamped a stamp on my hand. And it kind of glowed under a special light, like a fluorescent light. And, and that meant I could go in and come out, go out to the parking lot or you go in different parts of the park. You understand? That was a, a passport to get in and out. And, and we're told that the seal is going to be put on God's people, but not a visible seal that can be seen. It won't be a tattoo on the forehead. It won't be a chip that's implanted either in your hand or in your head. It is a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. Do you understand? But unless you have that seal, you will not be allowed on the chariot that's coming to take you to heaven. You have to have that, just as I had to have a boarding pass to get on, I had to be on time, I had to be in the right place at the right time, and I had to have my boarding pass in my possession which meant I'd had a ticket. And so, so when Jesus comes, he's looking for people that already have that seal. He doesn't just line everybody in the world up and stamp their hands and then they all get aboard. And this is the problem in apostate Protestantism as well as Catholicism. It says everybody's going to make it. They just may have to go through purgatory for a few years or a few eons and if you put some money in the offering box you'll get your relatives out of purgatory faster or in Mormonism they go and pray for the dead people and and they don't use the word purgatory but it's sort of the same idea or or they if you go to the average Protestant funeral they'll talk about as as one of my patients who recently had a sudden heart attack I, I went to the, see the husband and talk to him and try to bring some comfort and encouragement to him. He says, don't worry a bit, she's already up in heaven. Now, I didn't argue with him because I, I believe the Bible that says the dead know not anything and, and it's comforting to him that to know that his wife, as they say, is saved. But, but that is a misconception of what the soul is. When you are on an airplane and the airplane declares an emergency, the, the center or the air traffic controller will say, how many souls aboard and how much fuel do you have? Those two statistics are important to them to know how to uh, rescue people. How many souls aboard does not mean all the dead people. What does the word soul mean to an air traffic controller? How many live persons? Not how many cats are in cages or how many horses or how many dogs are being transported. How many people are aboard? So. Our government recognizes that a soul is a person. That came out of the Bible from creation. When God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, 
He had made him out of dust and man became a living soul. So a soul is a living person. So, so then this idea of, of a soul being all taken to heaven is unbiblical. It may be temporarily comforting. And, and at the bedside of a sick person, we don't want to just argue with them about a doctrine like that. But we want them to anchor their faith in Jesus. To me, it's more comforting to know that if, if my eyes close in death, that I don't know any of the bad things. I don't know the news that's getting worse and worse. I don't know the wars and rumors of wars. I don't need to know if my children have committed any sins or done some good deeds. I don't, I become unconscious at that point. To me, that's better. It's a more comforting doctrine because it's, it's the truth. It comes from the Bible. And so, so then we, we have God's people here that are sealed. And verse 3 says, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. What is in your forehead? The, the brain is in here. Three and a half pounds of rubbery gray substance, gray matter and white matter and... Um, ponds and medulla and you remember the anatomy at least the simple anatomy of the brain and and behind the forehead is the frontal lobes where your personality your willpower your judgment uh, what really makes you a unique person is there where you make decisions and choices and habits it's in the frontal lobes and so so God is wanting us to settle into the truth so that we love him so much that nothing anybody else can do will break that connection. Yeah. And, and not sickness. It's, it's, it's way beyond the marriage vow. If you, those of you who ever been to a wedding, either your own or somebody else's, they will say, will you pledge yourself to love and cherish this person in sickness? And in health, in prosperity, in adversity, for, forsaking all others to keep yourself solely to this person as long as you both shall live. You, you, some of you are sitting with a partner. You probably took that vow. And, and that meant that when you get sick and have a headache, you're still in love. When you have a uh, uh, cancer and they have to cut part of you out, you're still in love. When you have a baby and go through labor and all of that, you're still in love. You, you, you're still one, right? Two makes one. That's God's math. And so, so this is very important. And, and if you're a child, you're still part of the family. And, and if you have a godly father or mother, they'd give their life for you to save you. That's been done. And, uh, and so this, this is the ceiling in the forehead. Now it, we're told it's 144,000. Ellen White says in early writings, 144,000 in number, which tells me that God can count. In fact, he, he started off in the Garden of Eden counting, didn't he? The two shall become one. He, he, uh, he knows how to count. And Daniel, at chapter uh, 8, it's called Palmani, the wonderful numberer. You'll see that in the margin of your King James Bible, the wonderful numberer. So, so God is going to have some people that are going to stick with him no matter what. And, and I, want to, I want to see you there, friends. I want you to all be in heaven. And, and not because everybody's going there, because we have a song. Everybody talking about God ain't going there. Remember that spiritual? But you can be there. And you can save your children. And you can save your family. 
and you should pray for them more than ever before because the devil is angry and he's going around like a roaring lion to intimidate and to scare and distract and destroy. And, and very soon we're going to see it come to fruition. I don't know if this year is going to bring about massive civil unrest in America, but I highly suspect so. I think the desperate attempt of, of powers to control our government and to control the people of America is going to bring about terrible civil unrest. And, and whatever it takes, it can be economic, it can be racial, it can be judicial, it can be uh, pandemics, it can be any, anything to disturb and distract and destroy and especially zero in on God's people and prevent worship and evangelism and true development of faith. And so we're told that the season of distress before us, this is great controversy, I believe you find it in about 621, will require a faith that can endure weariness, delay, and hunger, a faith that will not faint though severely tried. And, and it's like you haven't seen anything yet. Even though some of you have had terrible trials. Some of you have lost loved ones. I lost my granddaughter. Uh, actually, I think she's safe in the arms of the Lord. But she laid down her life as a missionary in Nigeria. She was 18 years old. Went over there to teach uh, sewing and, uh, and nutrition. She was helping them get a restaurant started because she'd worked with her mother in, in Maine. And she went around to the church to saying goodbye before she went to Nigeria. And they said, well, we'll see you in, in three weeks or so. And she said, I'll see you in heaven. And they got a funny look on their face and they said, why did she say that? They had no idea. And, and I don't know that she did either, that she wasn't coming back. And so she got over there and she was teaching sewing. Have I told you this? I think I have. Uh, some of you are shaking your head no, so let me repeat in just one minute the simple condensed version. She was teaching sewing. They had to... The, the African people have not traditionally been modest. I, I could say the same of what I've seen in Washington State, in the, the airport or in the stores. Uh, but the African people needed clothes, not just uh, Goodwill or Dorcas clothes, but they needed to be instructed in what God's standards are. So she had them make dresses. The first dress they would make by uh, cutting, uh, holding cloth up to a person and cutting around the person and, and kind of matching the clothes to the size and shape of the person. And then they would sew them by hand, needle and thread. And they would make a sort of a sack dress. And, and once they'd done that, then they got to use a sewing machine, uh, the kind they have in the mission field that you turn a crank like this. So they're manual operated, uh, not, not the treadle ones, the old fashioned ones, that's too heavy and too big, but uh, a little tiny, and, then, and they were thrilled with that and they got to take newspaper and cut out a pattern for a person and kind of pin it together and then sew. And then if they did well on that, the third assignment, they could use an electric sewing machine and step on a pedal and brrr, And uh, oh my, they were so th thrilled. She had a whole class of young people that were learning to sew. And, uh, and then she got malaria. And uh, in one week, she ran high fevers, called her mother a couple of times, and then said, I don't think I'm going to make it home. She didn't. Uh, so, so we had a funeral for, for Miriam. And, uh, and that's quite a sacrifice to make, but we know she's safe because she was in service for God. And I've said all that to say this, God is looking for servants. 
the Bible has about a thousand place texts in the scriptures where either servant or servants is used if you look at a concordance. About a thousand of them. If you look in Ellen White's writings, there's 14,000 places in her writings where the word servant or servant. And many of that refers to God's people in the end of time. It's not believers that he's looking for. It's servants that are willing to go and put their hands to the plow or their hands to the hydrotherapy or to the massage or to the uh, offering people hope, the handshake. God's people are going to be servants. And, and it's also your protection in a time of intolerance and, and, and persecution because servants are the most valuable part to be preserved at all costs. And so God is going to use that to even save many of us. And that's why, and I, I close with this, why medical missionary work is the right arm of the gospel because it is something every member needs to be doing in some way or form, whether it's a loaf of bread or a remedy or, a, or taking somebody for a walk or bringing them to church. Uh, your hands are what God wants to use. Your mouth, yes, but your hands. And, and he wants to have a whole remnant of servants to show the universe these people stood with me and they followed the Lamb because he says, I am among you as one that serves. That serves. And so this is God's final testimony to the world that I can produce a group of people, a large group of people that will serve their fellow men in a way that never before has been seen. Not in the children of Israel, not in the time of Christ, only the disciples. And they had to be taught it because they didn't have it naturally. And we don't either. But God will teach us how to serve. So every morning, my uh, message to you is get down on your knees and pray, Lord, use me today. Help me to speak a word in season to those that are weary. Help me to use my hands. You've given me talents. Some are great cooks. Some are great writers. Some are industrial people, some are great musicians, and they can use their hands to bring a blessing to others and look for somebody you can help on a daily basis. And then come share your testimony and tell us what God has been doing for you to his glory. So how many want to be used by him? Any, I'm a recruiter today. I want to recruit servants for Jesus. May God bless you all today. Let's, let's close with our song now.